The expanded playoff is a good thing for Oregon State and Washington State. Can the Beavs make the playoff with Trent Bray going forward? You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights and Pac-2 dominated, beloved, and loaded conference of champions. Like, comment, subscribe, rate, review. Please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show. Today, I've got my man Carter Baines, 24-7 sports National writing desk, desk, beaverblitz.com as well. Carter, I see a world where if Oregon State, with their 2024 schedule, and presumably if they build a similar schedule in 2025 and beyond, can make the college football playoff. That is feasible. Not a given, but it is feasible. Where does Oregon State fit into the playoff picture now with Trent Bray at the helm of this program? As an at-large team around the 10 to 12 range, I think, if you're 11 and 1 or 12 and 0. And that's going to be easier said than done. Obviously, it's mostly a Mountain West schedule. I mean, the majority of Oregon State's games are against Mountain West teams, but there are opportunities there in quasi-conference play and in the quasi-non-conference to pick up quality wins. Obviously, the the rivalry game against Oregon gives you a, a probably a top 10 matchup. Uh, Washington State, you figure, will be decent. Uh, they're going to have the similar strength of schedule as, as Oregon State, probably going to be a, a somewhere above 500 team. And then, obviously, your, your Mountain West contenders in UNLV, Boise State, Air Force, I mean, there are opportunities for quality wins there. So I think if Oregon State goes 11 and 1, uh, depending on where those wins come, they could sneak in as that 11 or 12 seed. And if the, if Oregon State goes undefeated with that schedule, I mean, you're going to have the quality win over Oregon plus 11 others. Uh, it would be impossible to keep the Beavers out of the playoffs. So it does set up nicely for them to have a chance here, even without a conference, to make their way into the expanded playoffs. Yeah, I I think that they can fit into that discussion. The question is, are they going to be able to put that caliber team on on the field? I mean, the 12-0 remark you made is obvious. I think the 11-1 is a discussion, but a serious one. Help might be needed, could depend on who the wins are. Because if it's a loss to, you know, a 9-3, 10-2 Boise State team, but a win over top 10, 15 Oregon, well, suddenly – that's really something. Or maybe, you know, you lose close to Oregon, but maybe Cal pops in the ACC or Purdue had, you know, we've seen them make the top 25 before. I don't know if they can in the new Big Ten uh, quite quite as easily with Oregon, Washington, USC, UCLA coming in. But, you know, if that sort of thing happens, it it can help. But the, the next question is when you look at the schedule feasibility, I'm with you that, yeah, I mean, it's good enough if you get to that G5 standard that, teams have been held to in the past, whether you're talking about Tulane or whether you're talking about Cincinnati when they made it a couple of years ago, they were unbeaten with, I think, a fairly comparable, arguably perhaps even weaker schedule than what you know Oregon State will have next year. They went a perfect 13-0. They won their conference. But had they been a 12-0 independent in a 12-team playoff, yeah, I think they absolutely get in there. But the next question is probably the more important one, and that's with Trent Bray at the helm. Do you feel – that Oregon State can compete at that sort of level? Can they acquire talent and put together the sort of roster with, you know, now Ryan Gunderson as the offensive coordinator and Bray as the head coach, and we'll see what they end up doing at quarterback. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Do you feel confident in their ability to keep playing at the level where Jonathan Smith had them over the last two years? That's the key, obviously. You know, you can talk about going 11-1, 12-0, but – I mean, I don't think anybody's going to sit here and say that Oregon State's going to have the same caliber of talent and confidently say they're going to have the same caliber of coaching next year as they did this year. I, I think part of the getting to 11 and 1, 12 and 0, um, part of that equation is you're playing a weaker schedule, obviously. Um, look, Oregon State's lost quite a bit of starting talent to the transfer portal. Um, obviously, it's going to lose a bunch to, to graduation, the NFL draft, you name it. 
the Beavers are still going into this schedule, which again, not a Mountain West schedule, but a quasi Mountain West schedule with more talent, I think, than your top tier Mountain West team, because they're still coming in from Power Five. You have to remember this. I mean, no matter how much Oregon State loses, it was always going to be a respectable Power Five team next year. Um, so you bring that back down to the group of five level. I think Oregon State slots in right there at the top of those teams in the Mountain West uh, automatically, just with the amount of guys that are coming back that have Power Five experience, that are Power Five recruits with Power Five offer sheets in their recruiting background. Yeah, I, I think they're certainly closer to the top of the conference than the middle or the bottom of the conference, to be sure. I think their schedule, you know, I, I describe it as Mountain West plus. I, I think it's stronger than your typical Mountain West schedule. And all those teams have, you know, a good Power Five team or now Power Four team uh, on their five, if you include Wazoo and Oregon State, a lot of teams have uh, the Bees and Cougs on there. So there are some good resumes in there. And I think that, you know, I, I've had some people use that as a detraction point uh, to say like, oh, no, it's not actually, you know, that good of a schedule. It's a Mountain West schedule and whatnot. But we've seen Boise State playing in this caliber of conference before in the past and, you know, going all the way back to Utah as well, be ranked inside the top 10 if you win a bunch of football games. And I think the question is, how can they get there? And the biggest question for Oregon State along those lines right now is what are they going to do at quarterback? You know, DJ Uyungle in the portal. Aiden Childs off to Michigan State. Malik Murphy was recently on campus for a visit. I, I think that would be such a great addition for, for Oregon State. You can make the argument, I think, pretty easily that Malik Murphy could have – at least as much, if not more success than DJ Uyunglele had, if he decides to go to Oregon State. Yeah, and I think Duke's in play for Malik Murphy as well. Uh, I'm curious to see what that decision comes down to, because he was uh, in Corvallis, or at least in Oregon, uh, last night as we record this on Monday. The dead period begins this week. Um, but getting that visit in at the 11th hour, I think, could go a long way for Oregon State with Malik Murphy. Uh it, you know, Murphy had Oregon State offers out of high school. He's a West Coast guy. I think there could be some attractiveness to landing at a place like Oregon State where, you know, you're probably going to have some decent pieces around you. You know, you're going to be the guy coming in um, and it's close to home, whereas you, know, you stay out on the East Coast, you're further away from all of that. Um, there is a little bit of familiarity, I believe, with Ryan Gunderson from the recruiting trail as well. So, the ties are there. I think the fit is great. It's just a matter of whether he pulls the trigger there and, and picks the Beavers over some of his other offers. Um, another quarterback that I'm intrigued by is Giovanni McCoy at Idaho, who is in the transfer portal. He was a very prolific FCS quarterback, high scoring guy, dual threat um, that I think could be, I, I think Oregon State could be in play for him regardless of whether Murphy uh, gets to Corvallis because I, I think Oregon State's in a position now having lost two quarterbacks that they're not going to turn away another guy just because they get a guy of, of Malik Murphy's caliber. So uh, Giovanni McCoy is somebody that I, I, I would be intrigued to see how he fits at the FBS level. And and I think obviously he's, I'm not going to say he's as good as Aiden Childs, but he has that Aiden Childs skill set where he can make plays with his legs and he's got the strong arm as well. I, I think Murphy would be such a great fit because you bring in a guy, much like DJ Uyunglele was, that you have seen and can tangibly tell other potential transfer portal or high school recruits, we have a guy at quarterback that knows how to win football games at the Power 5 level. And that is, I think, a meaningful thing for, for players. I think it's a meaningful thing for fans. I think it's meaningful for Trent Bray who's got to win games in his first year. It's not like he has some crazy salary and contract where Oregon State couldn't, you know, if they decided to move off of him rather quickly if things start to go south. So I, I think that that could make a, a lot of sense. But there have been other transfers that have come in for Oregon State who are going to be on the field next year. Your next move online is, of course, going to go to eBay Motors. That's where Carter's going the moment we're done recording this show. I can sense it because he knows, like eBay does, that passion, drive, and patience, those things that bring home the winning trophy, also keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak 
performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash with all the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp and bring home that win like i said burning rubber not cash this is not texas a&m buying out jimbo fisher here we're not in that sort of space over at ebay motors so keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com that's ebaymotors.com ebay guaranteed fit only available to u.s customers eligible items only exclusions apply Okay, so Oregon State has made moves in the transfer portal this offseason. They really liked what they saw over in Colorado, which is a lot different than what a lot of people saw in Colorado this year after the month of uh, September in which they won just one game after the first three weeks. So three Buffaloes now, two offensive linemen, and a running back, Anthony Hankerson, have all come over. And I want to talk about kind of of each of them and how – they could fit into Oregon State's roster next year because this sort of stuff matters as to what we were talking about earlier, which is, hey, what kind of team is Oregon State going to put together? How good can they be? What caliber of players do they have? Let's start with the offensive lineman cart. Well, let's get to the offensive lineman second, actually. Anthony Hankerson, solid running back. Damian Martinez will be back next year. I think Hankerson is a good, solid, plug-and-play, respectable backup running back for the Beefs. Yeah, and productive when he had the ball. Obviously, he was uh, part of an offense that was loaded at the skill positions and was more often than not playing from behind and relying on the pass. And we know how much volume Shitter Sanders got. So I don't think Hankerson was necessarily in a a position to be racking up numbers regardless of what his role was. Um, But in a change of pace role at Oregon State, you know, spelling Damian Martinez, that's a role that we have seen all sorts of running backs thrive in at Oregon state over what the last five, six years. I mean, that second running back at Oregon state oftentimes looks like they could be a starter at every other PAC 12 school. So I think if, if, if Oregon state goes out and finds that guy that they want in that role, more often than not, you trust them that that player is going to produce. And I think Anthony Hankerson has a, a, a high three star transfer, uh, you know, is well-respected and is, going to command a role in the Oregon State offense. Yeah, and I think that Martinez has you know been so good the last couple of years, but you can't underestimate how good Deshaun Fenwick has been uh, as mm-hmm. well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but he's gone after this season out of eligibility, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Fenwick has had moments. I mean, he jump-started the offense against Washington State. I know there was a loss for the Beavs, but nothing was really working. Nothing was really getting going, and he – you know, was such a big part of that or the comeback in the Civil War in 2022. Fenwick was very much at the center of what Oregon State uh, did on the ground in in that game. And, you know, you want to have a number one bell cow back in a running back or in an offense like this. It's centered around a ground game, but you can't have it all be on the shoulders of one guy that can lead to him getting hurt, can lead to him getting tired as well. So I like the Hankerson edition. But let's talk about the other two. Just on the surface, if you just do the old thought experiment of say it out loud and see how it sounds. Adding two offensive linemen from Colorado's 2023 football team is not something that would excite me if I were a Beaver fan. Now, I talked about Van Wells here on the show, and let's start with him because he was a center for the Buffs. He was respectable, but, you know, I guess you could say average with – what his PFF grades were, like solid, decent, nothing special. Do you think he's Oregon State's starting center next year? No, I I do not. I think Oregon State has enough pieces coming back. Uh, I mean, they're going to lose quite a bit too on the offensive line, don't get me wrong, but they have enough pieces coming back and they've had the depth for years uh, to fill that starting lineup with, I think, a, a vast majority of guys who have already been on campus. I think Van Wells... And we'll get to Gerard Christian Lichtenan uh, in in a second. Uh, those guys, I think, are depth pieces who 
in Wells's case could potentially compete for a starting job, but I think you see a guy like Tanner Miller um, or a, a healthy Hanelli Bloomfield step into that role. Uh, guys who have more experience in the system. Dylan Lopez has been at Oregon State now for two or three years, uh, done some developing there. He was on the two deep. He'll be back. So I think the Beavers have enough pieces to to fill at least the the inner part of that line. I'm curious to see what they do at tackle, uh, but the, the interior should be fine. I think Van Wells fits in nicely there as a, a guy who can come in off the bench if needed, uh, an injury replacement, but. Uh, No, like you said, I mean, Colorado had, I think we can all agree, the worst offensive line, not only in Power 5, but in college football at the FBS level. I struggle struggle to think of one that struggled more than the Buffs. I I mean, Washington State couldn't run the ball for their lives this year, but Cam Ward wasn't under constant duress. I, I, I never seen, you know, it first showed up in the Oregon game for Colorado. I've never seen a quarterback be unable to to have time to throw the ball down the field like that and or when they even play, breathe in the pocket I, I mean yeah he was catching the ball and he had a guy in his face and sometimes it was a linebacker sometimes it was uh, a defensive lineman sometimes it was a safety or a corner like, it didn't matter and then the UCLA game was just as comical I, I like it, it's just the old Mike Tomlin line it's not funny but it's laughable because he had absolutely no shot there. If they get him an offensive line, I think Shadour is really, really good. But there was nothing there that made you feel good about the Buffs' offensive line. So talk about the other offensive linemen that that, that brought that they brought in, and where you think he fits in the Beavs' rotation next year. Well, he's a tackle, um, and again, I mentioned Oregon State needs tackle help, so. I, I think the idea behind bringing Gerard Christian Lichtenhan in is again, depth and relying on one of your guys that's been there to step into a starting role. Or maybe you can go out and and find somebody else. Tackles, and particularly left tackles, which Oregon State will have to replace with Josh Gray leaving, are essentially impossible to come by via the transfer portal. They're almost 100% of the time guys that you have to develop from within. Um, and, And Oregon State's had some great ones over the years, but I think if you're bringing in a transfer at that position, you're doing so as a depth piece. And again, we go back to the quality of player that you're getting here. You've already seen these two guys on the field at Colorado and that offensive line produced the second, well, they allowed the second most sacks of any unit in the country and their run run blocking was bad to the point that Colorado finished dead last in FBS and blocking. So I mean, there was no strength there. <laughs> There's no, you know, they relied on their run blocking or they relied on their pass blocking. There's that no line silver was lining. There was, there was, there was no hope, and it wasn't just bad. It was, ter- yeah. it was terrible. Yeah, it was a terrible line. And you're bringing in forty percent of that offensive line. I just don't see how that fits fits into a starting lineup when you have enough guys coming back uh, to fill a, a lineup without needing to turn to an outsider. So I think those are our second team guys, most likely. I, I think that's the best case scenario for the Beavs because the offensive line is so critical to what they do. When you're running a play action, heavy passing game, and you want to run the football, you have got to have a good offensive line or those two things are not going to work. The Beavs have had that the last couple of years. They've had uh, really good teams a- as a result. As you look at the transfer portal landscape now, quarterback, quarterback, of course, at the top of everybody's minds, but where else are you looking on this Oregon State roster for where they should continue to add players? Uh, they got to go to linebacker, I think. Losing Easton Mascarenas, Arnold Hurts. I mean, that's your leading tackler. That's probably your most disruptive player on the defense. Uh, losing Achille Arnold, too. I mean, the kind of a package deal as, as brothers there going to USC. I mean, that's two of your top four tacklers gone, um, which is not uncommon you know usually those are veteran guys who are moving on anyway but to lose them via the transfer portal when maybe you weren't banking on them leaving early uh that hurts and so i think you know filling the middle of that defense whether it's in the second level or in the back end um you know bolstering that would help because i mean you look at the guys that oregon state's brought in it's defensive lineman edge rusher edge rusher running back interior offensive lineman offensive tackle and cornerback. There's nothing in the middle of the defense there. And that's where some of your most glaring losses come. So um, that would be where I look outside of the quarterback position, but 
man, getting that quarterback uh, again, if you could get a commitment from a guy like Malik Murphy here early still in the transfer cycle, I think that would go a long way in potentially attracting other transfers as well. Yeah, I, I liked the Anthony Jones edition. I don't know if he's, you know, an all conference caliber, big impact guy, but it, he's got some good traits. And, you know, when he was at Oregon and I watched him a little bit, I thought he had some legit potential. And, you know, maybe third time's the charm for him uh, coming over from Indiana most recently for his school. But Oregon State's got one game to play in 2023 the Tony the Tiger Sun Bowl against Notre Dame. I think it's arguably the most important individual bowl game for a Pac 12 team outside of the college football playoff for Washington. So Ben Bull Branson, as he has been dubbed to me by a friend who's an Oregon State fan, is uh, going to start this game for for the Beavs. They were an eight-and-a-half-point underdog, down to six-and-a-half. Notre Dame's not going to have Sam Hartman there. I'm just saying, I like one team's ability to play with a backup quarterback more than another's. Marcus Freeman, of course, probably the more proven of the two head coaches in uh, this particular game. But Oregon State right now, you know, you talked about the momentum of Malik Murphy commitment could create. I think that's, you know, the only remaining factor nationally that people care about with bowl games that aren't in the playoff picture is what does it do to create momentum and energy around your program? Like Arizona, for instance, in the Alamo Bowl, winning 10 games, ending the year on a W7, beating Oklahoma in the state of Texas, that that's a momentum creator. For Oregon State, sitting at eight and four, two straight losses, lose your head coach, lose a couple of quarterbacks, lose a bunch of starters. If you go beat Notre Dame, not just win the Sun Bowl, but you beat Notre Dame, a ranked team here, I think that legitimizes the Oregon State program further in the eyes of many, including potentially recruits. And I think it does so in the college football playoff world as well, which we know perception matters a great deal. And going into next season, I think this game could very well determine whether or not Oregon State is ranked before the year, and we know how much preseason rankings do matter in this sport. Yeah, look, Notre Dame's going to be far from full strength. I mean, no Sam Hartman, no Audric Estime, no Joe Alt. I mean, those are your three top players on offense, uh, and they're all headed off to the NFL and, and opting out of this bowl game. So, like, Look, matchup-wise, I mean, if Notre Dame's minus its three best players on offense, Oregon State's minus its what X many players on defense and a, a quarterback, like maybe it's a little more evenly matched than it looks. Um, I, I am curious to see if if Oregon State, you know, rises to the occasion, says, "Hey, like, you know, this is this is it for us. You know, this is this is the end of our Power Five era. Let's go out with a bang." Let's play for this interim staff and and some of the new coaches that have come in. I'm I'm curious to see. I think Oregon State will have maybe the uh, the, the motivational edge here, and and that can make up for a lot in bowl games. I mean, we see it every year. The that more motivated that, that team can be an entire wins. bowl game. That can be an entire yeah. bowl game. Hundred percent. And I think Oregon State still has enough talent too to go toe to toe with Notre Dame. I mean, it's not like Oregon State's entire roster left. Um, so it's it's. It's there for the taking, and like you said, it would go a long way, I think, in the eyes of the college football world, and most importantly, the playoff committee. If you go and beat, albeit, again, a, an undermanned Notre Dame team. But Oregon State is undermanned, too. Un Oregon State's undermanned, too. Lost exactly. their starting quarterback. Damian Martinez isn't going to play. Leading tackler, second, two secondary players. Like There are a lot of guys that aren't going to be there for the Beavs, too. So I, I don't think the, you know, oh, Notre Dame was shorthanded excuse is going to fly. Yeah, and I think it's important, too, because Oregon State probably – you look at the roster Oregon, State, Oregon State's taking into the bowl game. It's a lot closer to the talent level of the Oregon State team we're going to see next year than the Oregon State team that just played 12 games. So this Oregon State team will be more telling of the one you're going to see on the field next year. If that team goes out and beats Notre Dame, that's going to give people I, – I think that will build a little bit of leeway – for Oregon State next year where you say, well, yeah, they had a weak strength of schedule, but we just saw this same group of guys go out and beat Notre Dame at the end of last season. So I think you can make the argument that maybe the, the quality of the team is better. It's it's like when a, 
a, a really good Boise State team goes 12-0 and in the Mountain West, and you say, well, yeah, the strength of schedule was rough. Like, how good of a team are they actually? Compared to Gonzaga basketball, right? Like, they always run through the West Coast, but when they get to the, the tournament, you see how good of a team they really are. I, I think if Oregon State, with this roster, goes and beats Notre Dame, they're going to get the benefit of the doubt next year because, by and large, it's going to be a very similar roster. And for those who are more in the camp of like, ah, you know, bowl games don't matter. They don't mean anything and whatnot. I, I understand where you're at. I don't happen to agree personally, and I enjoy bowl season thoroughly. Who saw that uh, Western Kentucky comeback against Heck Old yeah. Dominion? I mean, famous toastery bowl. 28 nothing in the toastery bowl. Inject me with that yeah. sort of stuff because who do you think feels better going to the offseason, Old Dominion or Western Kentucky? I'm going the Hilltoppers in that mm -hmm. particular spot. But even think about Oregon State. What were they preseason coming into this year? Number 15 in in the country? 15, 16? You think yeah, that was – uh, Yeah. Do you think that was at all tied to the fact that they were, I don't know, 10-3 and three the year prior and they had thumped Florida in the bowl game 30-3? to three? You think that had an impact? It, it's, you know, first impressions, last impressions can make a big, big impact on people. And this is Oregon State's chance to leave a last impression and – to your point, you know, you, you've got a roster that looks a lot closer to what it could be next year as they play, you know, a, a Mountain West plus schedule than the team that played in the in, in the Pac-12 this season. So I, I think it could be a really fun game. And, and I think it's frankly a really important game for for Oregon State as they head to El Paso and, you know, try to end the year with nine wins. It's not the season that Oregon State wanted. It's not the one they were fully capable of. But when this is the spot you're in, I, I think that a win here in the bowl game other than Washington would mean more to the beeves than any other PAC 12 team. So I know that uh, the spread is about a touchdown in Notre Dame's favor. I don't know what the total is at right now. I would lean under no matter what the, the number is. Cause think about these two teams in the matchup. I mean, Oregon state's obviously biggest loss is at the quarterback position. Uh, Damian Martinez sounds like he's not going to play. And then defensively, I mean, you're going to have the same staff there with Trent Bray coming back. Um, you know, Anthony Perkins still there in the defensive backfield. And then Notre Dame's a defense first team that's without its best offensive players. So, I mean, you're asking Oregon State to go win the type of game that it's won all year. Those defensive battles, smash mouth games, win in the trenches, uh, you know, grind it out and, and keep the keep the clock running, keep the possessions down. I think the style of play really uh, – it could be an X factor here for Oregon state in a game that will have a lot of eyes. Yeah. The sun bowl might not be the sexiest game. It's in El Paso. You know, it's, it's never the highest profile matchup, but it's always sold out. It's always on CBS and that prime slot uh, where you're going to have eyes on it from both coasts. If Oregon state goes out and makes a statement, like we just said, that's going to linger for the next nine months. And people are going to remember that when the preseason comes around and they're saying, well, what do we make of this Oregon state team that is in no conference that has a new head coach and who's, you know, half of the roster left beating Notre Dame goes a long way and in, in starting off on the right foot in the eyes of the, the prognosticators and the ones who set the preseason polls and, and all the way up to the committee. The line is Notre Dame minus six and a half. What do you think that over under total is, according to our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook? Man, so if I had to guess, I'd I'd say low forties. I'll say forty two. That is very sharp. It's forty three and a half. Yeah. So they're expecting a slugfest over there in El Paso. Looking forward to that one in all the bowl games as well. Carter Baines, BeaverBlitz.com, and twenty four seven Sports. Appreciate it as always. Thanks for having me. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.